This webcast is aimed at introducing you to the idea of atomic and molecular orbitals, the building blocks for our ability to describe electron density. And electron density, as you know from the last webcast, is useful for describing chemical bonding. What we want to do is to show you how to interpret the ways that we represent orbitals, the pictures that are used to represent molecular and atomic orbitals. And then we want to establish a relationship between an orbital and electron density. An orbital is really just a function. It's a mathematical function that has a value in three-dimensional space. If you give me a coordinate, an x, a y, and a z position, say 1, 1, 1, I could tell you what the value of that function is at that position. Sometimes we call this function a wave function, and that's synonymous with orbital. Those are three names that mean the same thing. Before going further, let me point you to one of the most useful resources I know that will help you understand molecular and atomic orbitals. It's called the Orbitron website, and I'd like to begin with um, the atomic orbitals. Take a look at the 1s orbital, and then carefully study the 2s and the 2p. That's really all you need to do, and I really would like you to focus on those three atomic orbitals. Those are the three that are most useful for organic chemistry. For each of those three atomic orbitals, Read the introductory material that's described down here. Take a look at the wave function and the various ways that it's represented, that's psi. Then take a look at the representations of electron density. As we'll see in just a moment, electron density is nothing other than take that function at any particular value and square it. The electron density is represented by several different ways, and one of those ways that electron density is represented is as a dot density profile. In other words, the density of the dots relates to the density of the electrons. And so take a look at that as well. So how do we represent psi in three-dimensional space? We use something that's called an isosurface. And an isosurface is shown here. You can see that the sh shape, basically, of that of that function in three-dimensional space is represented by an isosurface. What's an isosurface? An isosurface is a surface of constant value. That simply means that at any particular point on the surface, the function, psi, has a particular what we call threshold value. For the example shown here, the threshold value, as you'll see in just a moment, is plus or minus 0 0.2. That means anywhere on that surface, you are looking at the value of the wave, where the wave function is plus or minus 0 0.2. We represent negative regions by shading that surface gray, and we represent positive values by leaving that surface unshaded. Sometimes we use color. You'll often see instead of shaded gray and white, you'll see red and blue to represent positive and negative regions. The sign itself isn't so important, whether that means whether gray is negative or whether gray is positive. That's not so important. All we want to know is where is the wave function negative and where is it positive. Let's take a look at what the isosurface represents by taking the cylindrical shape and stabbing a symmetry axis through it right down the center of that cylinder. Let's take this blue line. The blue line in this graph represents the value of psi as we travel along the symmetry axis. So in, in going from the very left-hand side, moving inward, the value of the wave function becomes increasingly more negative. Until we hit our threshold value of 0.2, and that's a point of intersection where the cylindrical axis intersects our isosurface, and we encounter the position where the wave function is exactly 0.2. As we travel inward, inside of that isosurface, the wave function takes on a value that's even more negative until we exit, which is another intersection between that isosurface and that symmetry axis. And again, we have a value of 0.2 as we exit. We're now on the decrease, so we're, our, our negative values are getting closer and closer to zero as we exit that until we get to the nucleus. And at the nucleus, the wave function vanishes. It goes to zero exactly, and that has a special name. We call the position where the wave function has a zero value a nodal point. And you can see that there's a sign change at the nodal point. We were in the negative region, and now we're heading into the positive region as we travel along the symmetry axis further to the right until we encounter our isosurface, 
which again gives us an intersection with the symmetry axis and the surface. In other words, we've reached a position where the wave function takes on a value of 0.2. Now our traveling on that symmetry axis inside the isosurface, we encounter regions where the wave function is increasing above our threshold value of 0.2 until we get to the exit, which is another intersection of our symmetry axis and the surface, and the value there is again uh, plus 0.2. As we travel onward, and leave the isosurface, our wave function is diminishing, and far away from the nucleus, it goes to zero. I've already mentioned it, but the relationship between electron density and the value of the wave function is simply obtained by squaring the wave function. If we square psi, we obtain a direct relationship to the electron density, and on the Orbitron website, you'll see examples that look very similar to the pictures that are shown here. This is for the 2pz atomic orbital, and you can see the electron density, which is the square of psi, represented by isosurfaces with increasing threshold value as we go down. So this plane that's shown on the right-hand side shows the threshold value of electron density. The plane is just now uh, able to pick out some of the greatest electron density, the most intense electron density, where these regions are colored in, in red. And when the threshold is set at that high of a value, we uh, see that our isosurfaces are very small, meaning that the high electron density regions are located on the innermost part of this 2pz, 2PZ atomic orbital. As we travel down, we uh, have a threshold plane that is even lower, and that's the green threshold plane, and then the blue threshold plane, has a, a very low threshold, so we're picking up this region of space that extends way out, and we can see the concentric isosurfaces on the inside that show increasing uh, electron densities for the 2pz orbital.